Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records and I'm scared to do this album. <laughs> So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as TikTok with increased difficulty because of the whole UMG thing. I am scared to do this week's album. The absolute mammoth of There's a Riot going on last week took some of the pressure off, you know, until I posted it. But literally as soon as I hit save on that script document for the last time, I felt this spectacular lurch in my chest. Jazz authored a lot of how the 60s and 70s went. Miles Davis's sketches of Spain inspired Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit. Charlie Watts, Bill Ward, Mitch Mitchell, Ginger Baker all had backgrounds in jazz. Blind Faith's Do What You Like is basically rock and roll's take five. And Carlos Santana lifted a decent chunk of his playing style from Gabor Zabo. Both the future and the past of psych were jazz. Jimi Hendrix, of course, had studio time booked with Miles Davis before he passed, and arguably the first psych song, The Birds is Eight Miles High, was inspired by today's artist. As intertwined inextricably as jazz is with my area of focus, it's still intimidating as hell, so why not start with one of the greatest recordings of all? Go big or go home, right? This week's album is the one, the only, Jan Coltrane's A Love Supreme. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls where sometimes you get to pick what's on the show. You can find all of that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a reissue marked from 1995 by Impulse Records. This is the label that originally issued Coltrane's recordings. No, you do not need to spend $400 on a 45 RPM box set of this. This sounds just fine. I got it off Turntable Lab, it's my personal favorite site to buy new vinyl from, you know, when I have the budget to be buying new vinyl. I'm not sponsored by them in any way. I've just had good experiences so far. Everything I've bought has been packaged well and sounds good. Considering the nightmare experiences all of us vinyl collectors have had buying online, good packaging and good sound quality is really all you can ask for. So let's talk about this cover art which was chosen by John himself. This was photographed by Bob Thiel. It's a naturalistic portrait of the man of the hour at work. And we have the same image on the reverse, just with the personnel named. This might get a little funky if I accidentally pick a jacket up backwards. And opening up the gatefold, we have an illustration of John and his sax by Victor Kalin, accompanied with liner notes and a prayer written by John. This was the only time he ever wrote anything for his album packaging. We will get into both the notes and the prayer in the next chapter, I promise. But first we have to introduce our players. On A Love Supreme, we have our band leader, John Coltrane on tenor sax and vocals on acknowledgement. McCoy Tyner on piano, Jimmy Garrison on double bass, and Elvin fucking Jones, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, on the drum kit and the timpani. A Love Supreme is produced by Bob Thiel, engineered by Rudy Van Gelder. Roll transition. <laughs> Right, so A Love Supreme's liner notes have made my job this chapter of the video both 
infinitely easier and infinitely more difficult. Infinitely easier because a lot of the story of Love Supreme comes right from Coltrane, and infinitely harder because now I somehow have to bring new insight to this. So let's briefly dip into these liner notes and see where we can tie them back to events in our man John's life. Of course, Mr. Coltrane composed a Love Supreme after having a spiritual experience. He grew up in a Christian household, but didn't have this quote, spiritual awakening until 1957. Though we don't know exactly what this experience was, he said it, quote, led him to a richer, fuller, more productive life. That sounds exactly like someone getting sober, and that's exactly what he did. Like some of the rock stars we've covered on this very rock and roll centric channel, John had a rough time with drugs. Heroin and alcohol, both depressants. It got him fired from Miles Davis's group. Then he quit cold turkey, which is so dangerous and something you should not do. John's habit no doubt affected his marriage to his first wife, Naima. Again, not unlike a rock star, John had rocky relationships with earthly muses and Naima was one of them. He wrote several pieces of music for her, like, well, Naima on Giant Steps. <laughs> that has other music, which is very good. Uh, Naima reminds me of something 50s Sun Ra would do. Uh, the reason Naima is so important in John's greater biography is because she showed him the existence of a god. She was Muslim. The reason I don't just say God is because John was quoted in the meditation liner notes a little after this, saying he believed in all religions. So a God can be whatever God you choose from the capital G to Eric Clapton. Being only a casual Coltrane fan, I was surprised to learn of Naima's existence because when I think of Coltrane muses, specifically devout religious Coltrane muses, I think of the woman in his life life when A Love Supreme was written and recorded. In 1963, John met Alice McLeod, soon to be Alice Coltrane. She was an exceedingly rare type in the world of music, both an artist and a muse. With a brief look at her biography, I can see why John was so taken by her. They came from the same world, really. Alice came from a musical family. She was a pianist at this time, and no amateur. She studied in Paris, played at the Blue Note Club, formed her own group in Detroit. Having your own group is a huge deal for a female musician in the 60s. And like John, Alice grew up in religion. Both things she's most known for today her heart playing and her devotion to Hinduism came after John's passing, but still, there's some common ground here. In 1964, Alice gave birth to her first child with John and would have been just pregnant with her second when A Love Supreme was recorded. So there was a lot of new love in John's life, not just for his God. So I keep making a point of what's going on surrounding the writing of A Love Supreme. What makes this so different from his previous work? like Crescent. Terribly underrated, by the way. It is a tragedy that this has been so overshadowed by this. Anyway, the difference is A Love Supreme was, well, written. Before this, Jan's compositions were a lot more open. There's this thing called modal jazz that I do not understand a lick of, but he wrote using that. John sequestered himself in the attic of the home he shared with Alice for like two weeks straight and meticulously arranged how this project would go. Here, are his notes. I do not understand a thing going on here, so jazz heads that will surely be lighting up this comment section this week, if you could translate that for the rest of us, that would be awesome. <laughs> I Love Supreme was recorded mere weeks before its release in a single session at Van Gelder Studio in Englewood, New Jersey on December 9th, 1964, and oh my god, I forgot to properly introduce the quartet. Okay, so John played with lots of other cats in the 60s, see this recording I quite like with Milt Jackson. I finally got to say cats in a video! I love this. But this 
is the group that people think of when they think Coltrane. On piano from Philly, we have McCoy Tyner. He's been playing with John since their rendition of My Favorite Things in 1961, and he's leading his own group too. Jimmy Garrison on bass, he came from the Philly scene too, that's where that connection comes from. He is a seasoned player, notably with Ornette Coleman. He replaced Reggie Workman in the quartet, and on drums, Elvin, Fucking Jones. He played with Miles Davis, Charlie Mingus, Sonny Rollins's group when they recorded a defining statement of 1950s jazz, A Night at the Village Vanguard. It's not my personal favorite 1950s jazz recording, that would have to be Dizzy Gillespie's Afro, but I hereby recognize Village Vanguard's greatness due in part to Elvin's presence on it. He started playing with Coltrane in 1960. This absolute dream team recorded a Love Supreme in one three-hour session with John's favorite engineer, Rudy Van Gelder, manning the board. After thanking this quartet in the liner notes, John says this, also to Archie Shep and to Art Davis, who both recorded on a track that regrettably will not be released at this time. In the near future, I hope that we will be able to further the work that was started here. John wanted to take another stab at this piece just to see what would happen, so on December 10th, Art filled in on piano, and Archie, another saxophone, joined the mix. These recordings have since been released. It's really cool to hear an elaboration on this material, but I won't be covering it in detail here since it's not on the original release of the record. The track listing of A Love Supreme goes as follows. This might just be the shortest this chapter of the video will ever be. Opening up side one, we have acknowledgement, and closing side one, we have resolution. Opening up side two, we have pursuance, and closing side two, we have Psalm. A Love Supreme was released in January of 1965 and is regarded as one of the greatest jazz albums ever. How good is it? So good that... I'm sorry, am I reading this right? It's, it's so good. They sainted the man who wrote it? From the mission statement of the Saint John Coltrane, African Orthodox Church in San Francisco, California. Quote, to paint the globe with the message of a love supreme, and in doing so, promote global unity, peace on earth, and knowledge of the one true living God. I watched a documentary on this church and it's really interesting, man. Their belief started out that John Coltrane himself was God and a love supreme was the word of God. For a time they worked with Alice Coltrane as the wife of God. They split, uh, they linked up with the African Orthodox Church a little later and then uh, demoted John from God to a saint. Patron Saint. So why was A Love Supreme so highly critically acclaimed upon release? We don't usually see that on this channel. Usually it takes critics a while to catch up to greatness. Coltrane had already fully permeated music, including rock and roll. I'm spotlighting rock and roll specifically to help put A Love Supreme in context with the rest of this channel's content. Ray Manzarek of The Doors cited My Favorite Things as inspiration for the composition of light my fire. Fathers of Psych the Birds were inspired by Africa Brass and Impressions to write arguably the first psych song, Eight Miles High. Worth mentioning the lick at the beginning of Eight Miles High is reminiscent of the opening flourishes of both Crescent and A Love Supreme. Moving from Laurel Canyon to San Fran, Phil Lesh of the Grateful Dead cited both the John Coltrane Quartet and Miles Davis's quartet with John Coltrane as inspirations. But the most rock and roll treatment Coltrane ever got was this. This is Love, Devotion, Surrender by Santana and the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Rock and Rolls, A Love Supreme. Carlos Santana and John McLaughlin teamed up to make this album as both a tribute to Coltrane and an expression of their Indian spirituality. They both followed the same guru. Again, I can't go too much into this one, even though I 
really, really want to, uh, but I will say The Life Divine is one of the greatest pieces of music ever recorded, and I never would have known about this album had it not been for somebody sending it into my P.O. box. Thank you, kind stranger. Looking at its place in Coltrane's discography, A Love Supreme was both a beginning and an end. He'd hit a wall with the hard bop style. This is basically everything that could do. What do you do when you've exhausted your options? You expand, you expand your, your horizons, horizons man. man. Sounds pretty psychedelic to me. After this record, John ventured into freeform jazz. No fixed melody, no home key. You can thank his new bestie, Albert Eiler, for that. You can even hear John's style shifting in the few live performances of A Love Supreme we had. Here's acknowledgement in this place in France that I cannot pronounce and I'm not going to try. <laughs> Pretty far out, right? By playing with dissonance and stretching the principles of music farther than he ever had before, he sought to mirror the unrest he experienced living through the mid-60s. Who knows how crazy his style would have gotten had he lived to see 1968. This stylistic shift brought the end of Coltrane's classic period and the beginning of the final stage of his career the avant-garde. He established his new direction with Ascension with Art Davis and Archie Shep from the Love Supreme sessions. I love a good full circle moment. There is a lot to get into this next chapter of the video, so let's go right into it. What do I think of a Love Supreme? Going in. Holy sh- <laughs> If I thought I was in trouble within the court of the Crimson King, if I thought I was in trouble with there's a riot going on, <laughs> I'm in danger. In the brilliant words of the assistant professor of the London Calling episode, Dr. Insomnia, I'm, quote, not just dealing with a typical flesh and blood album. This is the gospel according to St. John, the voice of the Holy Spirit made manifest by the prophet called Train. I have these episodes scheduled out months in advance. It helps me prepare for what I'm evaluating and make sure I don't cover too much of the same thing in a row. I've had a Love Supreme scheduled this month for a while now. I got to really listening to jazz because of my favorite band, no matter how hard I try, it always comes back to the MC5 somehow. They openly proclaim their love of Sun Ra and Albert Eiler. Rob Tyner, love of my life, was a beatnik before the five. He was big into Charlie Mingus, Sonny Rollins, Cannonball Adderley, and Coltrane. He named himself after the pianist on this very album. In the weeks since this video has been scheduled, it's taken on a whole new meaning. This is my first Vinyl Monday I've had to write where I'm no longer uh, in the same realm as one of my f***ing heroes, Wayne Kramer. Um, the guy who was always trying to push the Five's direction into jazz. He made jazz records through his solo career, and Archie Shep was one of his favorites. His band was the reason I paid attention to jazz. I did it to trace their lineage back, to understand these crazy new sounds I was hearing. I go really hard on at least one album every week and have done so for almost three years. With all of the music I listen to, I don't have much time to listen to music. And as many albums as I cover, very few of them are in my everyday listening rotation. Today is different. Considering all of the times I've heard a Love Supreme, I should know it like the back of my hand, but I don't. John said himself, you have to come to the music yourself gradually. Not everything must be received with open arms. I 100% agree. Even Santana and John McLaughlin needed to listen to this many, many times to get it. Jazz by nature is denser than dense. That's the beauty of it. You can throw it on in the background as nothing music, but if you actively listen, you'll have an entirely new experience every time. For this reason, A Love Supreme has proven exceedingly difficult to evaluate. People have written whole books on this record alone. 
hundreds of thousands of pages on just 32 minutes of music, the length of an average 60s pop record. As much as I appreciate those authors' efforts, they really only make sense to the few people left in the world who can read music. For everyone else, myself included, it's a foreign fucking language. Two things that seriously hinder my ability to review this the way you're used to me reviewing music. Number one, I am not a musician, let alone at the caliber of a jazz musician. I have little to no knowledge on the technical terms of music. All I have is what I feel. So this review will be focused more on the feeling. I'll reference super basic technical stuff when I absolutely must. And number two, I'm not capital R religious. Like... This is gonna be exhausting to explain. <laughs> I can count the times on one hand I've been into a church. They were all for family weddings, which we tailgated, shotgunned beers outside of, because we're a classy bunch. You saw my perfume tray in the ABH intermission. I literally made a joke about my prayer candle. I have meditated. I have read the Gita, but for philosophy reasons, my rosary beads hang next to my evil eye. I worship... <laughs> Politics last week, religion this week, call it the topics you shouldn't bring up at Thanksgiving miniseries. What I can state in more articulate terms is this. I believe humans have an innate need to devote ourselves to something bigger. Humans need to have a purpose, whatever we choose, whether it's a career or a family, uh, in my dad's case, staying sober, or in Coltrane's case, his God. It's human nature. I have a lot of love and not a lot of places for it to go, but now and again there are these moments in my life. Uh, the first time I heard Layla, discovering Bob Dylan, opening the Kick Out the Jams gatefold for the first time, where this thing a lot bigger than me called to me, uh, some feeling that came out of the ether to grab me by the shoulders and say, this is your purpose. This is your devotion. Rock and roll. That is the love supreme. I am far from the only one who loves rock and roll so much that they find it in every facet of their lives without even looking. Roadies, groupies, fans, everyone who's ever bought the records, and the guys who made the records themselves. We are all called to by this thing so much bigger than us. In that sense, maybe the subject matter of a love supreme isn't so foreign after all. I first listened to this in hopes of feeling closer to my favorite band, and I was rewarded with the only jazz record I truly love, because it is an expression of ultimate love. According to Lewis Porter in John Coltrane, His Life and Music, the four parts of a love supreme, quote, suggest a kind of pilgrim's progress, in which the pilgrim acknowledges the divine, resolves to pursue it, searches, and eventually celebrates what has been attained in song. This is how the Coltrane Church interprets a love supreme. Quote, acknowledge your sins, resolve to amend them, pursue that path, and psalm the final prayer, give thanks to God. Here's a quote from John, featured in John Coltrane, His Life in Music, that lays out pretty precisely how he related his life's work to his spirituality. My music is the spiritual expression of what I am, my faith, my knowledge, my being. Being the things you love, devoting yourself wholly to what you believe through the medium of music, is the core of the late 60s counterculture. It's f***ing wild to me that John thought this way. He died Died in 67. He didn't get to see the Summer of Love through. He didn't get to see jazz go electric like Miles Davis did. Is this the first pre-psych album I've covered on Vinyl Monday ever? This is one hell of a pick. Because of my familiarity with the Gita, I'm probably gonna use this word a lot. Enlightenment. To me, acknowledgement feels like the chapter in the Gita where Krishna reveals himself to be an avatar of the god Vishnu. This lovely little poster, that which inspired the Axis Bold as Love cover, is only a fraction of what Arjuna would have seen. Vishnu is everything. He reveals his infinite physical forms. Us, as humans, 
cannot comprehend infinity. This was Arjuna's call to rise to the occasion and be a noble leader in battle or whatever. Basically, it's the beginning of the hero's journey. Religious or not, if you know the archetype of a hero's journey, whether it be from Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, there's no need to be intimidated by a love supreme. You'll follow the story of the music just fine. A love supreme's statement of gratitude to a god begins with an awakening. I've heard this opening flourish described as screaming, but I've always found it gentle and warm. Like waking from a deep sleep, your cover's warm from the sunlight. John did this kind of thing a lot at the beginning of his pieces from this period in his career. This is no doubt the most iconic of the bunch. The cymbal wash and bright but soft piano reminds me of Turner's paintings of Sun Over the Water. Brilliant and vibrant, but still a little hazy. Coltrane pulls back so Tyner and Jones can break the wave on the shore. These mini crescendos on the cymbal like rippling water. What made Elvin Jones so great was his understanding of texture and space. Now, my buddy Matthew has some odd music takes. Not without grounds to have those takes, he listens to almost as much music as I do. One of those odd opinions has to do with jazz drumming. He really doesn't like it when drummers keep time on the hi-hat. Sure, Elvin does that on acknowledgement, but then you have these deep rumbling. He was so great because of how he employed texture, dynamics, and space. No stone is left untouched, and it's done with such effortless intricacy that Elvin himself said something to the effect of he could never play the same thing twice, and he could never write down what he played. Anyway, cue Jimmy Garrison's entrance with the ostinato. That's a fancy music word I learned for repeated motif. <laughs> It's the core of this whole work, the syncopated da -da -da -da, you know it. Here we have one of the most interesting things about the whole suite, Tyner playing both a melodic and a rhythmic part. I gotta say, it feels really weird saying that last name in a context that isn't the kick out the jams motherfucker one. I am an uncultured swine and I am proud. The chords he plays are sort of the mise-en-scene to the upcoming sax solo. When I think John Coltrane, this is the solo I hear. Acknowledgement expresses a full breadth of emotion that comes with ultimate love, peace, fervor, elation, torturous, cathartic passion. Just listen to how he makes that sax's voice crack and those feverish arpeggios. On the come down, he jumps on that ostinato himself, transposing it to each of the 12 keys of Western music. That anticipates the chant, the only vocals we get on the whole record. A love supreme. A love supreme. This is the only time John ever cut vocals on one of his records, so it's a big deal. It sounds like chanting a mantra in deep meditation. Coltrane, Tyner, and Jones each gracefully drop out, leaving Garrison to finish this one off. He strays from the chorus into a run, finishing this chapter with a classical flourish. Feather light, you can almost hear his fingertips on the neck of his instrument. This changes the key to E flat, which leads us right into Resolution. After Jimmy's anticipatory intro, Resolution bursts into action, blooms really. Now that the hero is called to action, or the sinner admitted to his sinning, he solidifies his intent to be on God's path. There is a lot going on in these first two minutes. John lobs this chapter's off-balance theme at us, like not knowing how to go about your journey just yet, just knowing you must do it. It's off balance, but it always catches its fall with... Jesus Christ, I don't even know what Elvin is doing, but it's brilliant. It makes no sense, and that's why it works. Every part in this song is so disjointed that it somehow locks together. Then comes the first honest-to-goodness piano solo of the record. I can explain what made Elvin Jones so great. I deal with drummers every week, and I don't deal with the keys as much, uh, so I don't have the vocabulary just yet 
to explain why Tyner was great. The first part of Resolution is a bit darker and all over the place. He guides it to simultaneously brighten it up and cool it down. These runs are ridiculous. They whirl around each other so gracefully. I can't tell where one hand starts and the other hand ends. Maybe that's what made him so great. His left and right hands were completely untethered. The call and response bit is the most grounded part of the solo, a fun little conversational bit, before slipping back into the dance. Somehow, by the end of his second solo, John brings it back to the resolution chorus. The way he kind of drops in reminds me of the solos changing hands on Light My Fire by the Doors. Not so much an elbow in, but like an okay man, I'll take it from here, you can trust me. He riffs on some of those ideas Tyna rattled off. Somehow, you have to have an incredible memory to be a jazz player. What's so interesting for a piece called Resolution is that overall, there's very little resolution in the music. By looping back around to the central theme, any and all piece established in the piano solo is undone. We've re-established tension, which is such a no-no for the music I usually cover. I guess it works when you consider what part of the story we're in, no path to enlightenment is smooth. There will always be trials and tribulations along the way. This is the most concise end to a song on the record. A three-peat, a sweet sign-off, and a drum roll. We've gone from day to night. Pursuance is the fervor of the journey. The temptation, the ultimate or final test. Holy shit, Elvin Jones! He opens up side two with this total assault on the kit. We careen into a series of dizzying rolls which tumble blindly into each other. This sensory overload is in no set meter, keeping us hanging on the edges of our seats for 90 seconds straight. This is the longest minute and a half of your life. Then the kick to the pants that sends us full flying off the chair, the rest of the guys come in. John chops up and flips the A Love Supreme chorus, um, angling it into a steady ascension. This is a rare moment where not everything is so graceful. For these first few seconds after Jones' is solo, uh, not everyone is on the same page. Garrison is still feeling things out. It's such a beautiful human moment on a record that feels pretty superhuman. The rhythm section links up as Tyner paints the scene with another solo. It's got palpable motion. It's very gestural the whole way through. I love this part right here. Very classic jazz. He keeps this momentum going for several minutes. After a spectacular final drop down to earth, Coltrane comes back with a vengeance. He's pushing the sax to its very limit, straining and breaking its voice as if to cry out in pain or babble incoherently. And he keeps that up for three minutes. You gotta appreciate these guys' endurance. It keeps ramping up to an impossible pace until the song crashes back down to earth in the form of more fiery drum rolls and cymbal crashes. Pursuance is bookended by our rhythm section. We have Elvin on the intro and Jimmy on the outro. Side note, if you're listening on vinyl and through a stereo system, the bass solos might be hard to hear. Some people will get grumpy about this little pointer, I have no doubt. But headphones will help you hear it. These bass passages will also be a dead giveaway for if your copy has a lot of surface noise. Jimmy's solo has a dejected twist on the core Love Supreme motif. This is gonna be such a those drums have such empathy me moment. But I feel melancholy from this. The bass all by itself, especially after such a chaotic part of the suite, feels lonely. Enlightenment can be quite lonely. You have to sacrifice a lot. A final pluck of the strings and mournful piano chord takes us right into Psalm. The sigh of relief, a celebration of enlightenment finally achieved after much struggle and pain. This song is John's time to shine. McCoy, Jimmy, and Elvin all step back. Um, they fill in the gaps with bubbling cymbal washes, rumbling timpani, a sparse bass line, an impressionistic piano. Psalm is John's wordless prayer, that which he wrote words for, 
in the liner notes. No road is an easy one, but they all go back to God. With all we share God. It is all with God. It is all with thee. Psalm is ethereal. There's no root chord progression, no meter, no central motif. Nothing anchors this thing to the ground. I feel like the brain meme when I hear this. And I'm reminded of just how much of a moron Ben Shapiro was for saying rap isn't music because it doesn't have any of the principles of music or whatever. This has none of those above principles of music, and yet it's music at the highest caliber. I'm not totally sure which sequence John plays is supposed to be which phrase in the prayer, but he's expressive through his note choice and subdued delivery. I've always felt bittersweet resignation from the end, the thunder rumbling away into the distance, rubble left in the wake so something new can rise. Uh, maybe that's just my connection to creation stasis, destruction. In order for creation, there must be destruction. In order for life, there must be loss. I've taken great comfort in that idea over the past week or so. That, the picture of rock and roll heaven I've conjured up in my brain, and just an ungodly roar coming from my turntable. Damn it, Wayne! Why'd you have to die? You're making my neighbors hate me! One last note. As John had his spiritual awakening in 1957, there are these smaller attempts at articulating his reverence for God throughout the late 50s and early 60s. Like Crescent, it's basically a proto-love supreme. Or maybe even Naima. All of the greatest rock and roll love songs ever written, you can't quite tell if if they're about a woman or about a god. While yes, a love supreme is a statement for a god, it also had an earthly muse, John's love for Alice and their babies. Either way, it's all ultimate love. A love supreme is no doubt Coltrane's most personal work. It's so sacred that there's only one or two instances of the John Coltrane quartet playing the whole thing live. It's a man professing his unique relationship with a higher power. Uh, that's as personal as you can get. But like I said, I boil a love supreme down to ultimate love. That's human nature. A love supreme is the deepest expression of gratitude ever put to a record. It only bolstered in its glory by an all-star lineup of the best guys to ever sit at a bench behind the kit or... The chemistry of this quartet is a testament to both their greatness and a love supremes. There's little more vulnerable than bearing your soul like this for all to hear, mortal and divine. Anything I say to round out this video will feel like a massive understatement. I know it will. It's par for the course, but... Since I'm a rock and roller, I'll borrow some words from the title of a rock and roller's interpretation of this music. A love supreme is an expression of ultimate love, the deepest devotion, complete and total surrender. This shouldn't be so intimidating to us after all because there is a love supreme in everything we do. My personal favorites off this one are the whole thing. If you wanna keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it. That's A Love Supreme by John Coltrane and his quartet. What do you think of this album? What do you think of A Love Supreme or just jazz in general? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And remember, removing art from its historical, philosophical, political, or religious context isn't ethical. It's poor journalism and it's bad analysis. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye!